Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this, our next session, the 2023 Rising Visionary Award. Uh, my name is Jim McGran. I, I have the honor and privilege of being the current chairman of the board for Prevent Blindness, and I'm going to be moderating this session. Um, I would like to introduce you to our award recipient, Christina Ambrosino, a medical student at Johns Hopkins University. She was selected as the recipient of the Prevent Blindness Rising Visionary Award, which recognizes a student or resident in optometry, ophthalmology, primary health, nursing, or other health professions in the United States who has the best overall application and essay in response to this year's topic. And this year's topic was identify a public health opportunity to advance vision and eye health in the United States through public health policy, practice, or research. Christina's award submission discussed the importance and effectiveness of trainee-led vision screening organizations. These screening organizations work with partnering trainees with local care providers to conduct community vision screenings and coordinate follow-up care. An additional benefit is that these programs foster trainee interest in eye care careers. So please let me introduce and welcome Christina Ambrosino. Hello. So I first just wanted to thank everyone at Prevent Blindness so, so much um, for this award here. I'm also incredibly grateful to both my mentors, Dr. Meg Collins and Dr. Thomas Johnson, for the opportunities I've had to get involved in vision and public health. And I really just can't stress how much their support has meant to me. So my presentation today is called Why the Eye? Collaborating with Learners to Respond to Community Identified Needs. As a brief self-description, I'm a mid-20s woman with long hair, wearing a cream-colored turtleneck and sitting in front of a, a cabinet in a mirror. I have no disclosures. For my objectives, today I'd like to cover three main things, and those are to first describe the current state of U.S. ophthalmology instruction, to talk about opportunities in for ophthalmology-related community service and how that can be used to engage learners in vision and eye care. And then finally, to describe the opportunities to connect that ophthalmology service learning with social determinants of health education. So to dig into that first objective, compared to decades prior, US medical schools currently are providing fewer curriculum hours there on the left, and fewer schools have mandated clinical rotations within ophthalmology on the right. And so this means that nowadays, most graduates are finishing their medical training with about 12 and a half hours of training about vision, eye care, eye disease, and they're graduating without seeing eye care in the clinical setting. However, there's a need really now more than ever to get more people involved in and excited about uh, vision and eye care because there are workforce shortages, especially within the fields of pediatric ophthalmology, and there are both racial and gender disparities within the workforce. So that brings us to the question, how do we get more individuals from diverse backgrounds to learn and be interested about vision and eye care while in their training? And one start along the path uh, to a solution could be through those training um, and community service opportunities within ophthalmology, which are actually quite common across medical schools specifically. They're available in about 75% of schools on most recent surveys. So these ophthalmology service learning programs themselves um, can serve a few different purposes. I've listed here. First and foremost, they are an opportunity to respond to community identified needs about vision and eye care. Second purpose could be to supplement medical school education. Um, and the third could be to provide learners instruction about social determinants of health, which is another area that's often overlooked in medical education. And so to go into these possible applications a bit more in depth, I'll be focusing on the Johns Hopkins um, 
vision screening program, uh, which is shortened as, as vision. This program was started as a direct response to community input in partnership with a local nonprofit, which is pictured here. It's called Charm City Care Connection. And what they had done back in 2012 is they'd surveyed the East Baltimore neighborhood about just current and understanding health needs in, in that community and found that vision and dental care services um, came out on the top of their list. And the founder of this vision program and a then medical student and current incredible faculty member, Dr. Johnson, had responded to this community priority um, in partnership with multiple faculty members at the Wilmer Eye Institute in Johns Hopkins. And um, Dr. Johnson now actually advises the vision program, which remains student run. And that's also to say that vision at its heart is working to alleviate one of the needs of the local community, um, but it's also certainly benefiting um, the people who are involved in it, the medical students and volunteers as well. And to say a little bit more about that, a recent mixed method study compared vision volunteers to non-volunteer medical students. And from survey data, it was found that volunteers were more confident in performing ophthalmology clinical skills. Those are things like looking at the visual acuity, the eye pressure, and using a handheld tool to look at the back of the eye, as well as explaining vision and eye-related problems to patients. And then in interviews, um, we'd found that uh, volunteers related those experiences um, to being helpful in their own career exploration. And although the study was limited to medical student volunteers, I will also mention that Vision has also involved um, a number of undergraduate volunteers, as Spanish translators and postback volunteers. And so some of these effects, especially in relation to career exploration, might be particularly meaningful for people who are um, a, a bit younger or earlier on in their training. And now onto the third objective, which is to discuss how all of this might relate to social determinants of health. So if we consider that uh, original survey that was done by Charm City Care Connection, the nonprofit, that asked East Baltimore residents about their health needs, that survey took place in the same neighborhood as Johns Hopkins, a pretty large hospital. And so it's important to think about what other kinds of systemic factors might have been at play here that were preventing people from accessing needed medical care, needed appointments that could have been just down the road from them. And we've seen this with the vision program where a lot of the people that are referred for follow up appointments at Wilmer aren't actually able to attend. And so we wanted to look into possible solutions to increase the program's follow up. And to do that, we partnered with a truly wonderful organization called Hopkins Community Connection that's based out of a pediatric clinic and works to address social determinants of health. It was actually recently shown to be associated with the higher follow-up rates within that pediatric population. So by partnering with HCC, Hopkins Community Connection, um, this created an opportunity for vision volunteers to also have a hands-on experience learning about and addressing social determinants of health. And so to give a bit more of a sense what this looks like, this here is an excerpt from the screening tool used by Hopkins Community Connection. You can see how it goes through things like food security, transportation, utilities, public benefits, and vision also um, asks about insurance status because that's really relevant for our program in terms of um, getting people not just short-term follow-up, but also um, something longer term. And I think it's really valuable for med students and other volunteers to get the chance to practice asking about these social factors and to learn from the responses that they hear from um, the people who are being screened, um, especially as this might not always, again, be something that's very emphasized within the medical school curriculum. And in terms of next steps, I want to just briefly recognize that there's a lot more opportunity in terms of building community input in both the vision program and overall in ophthalmology, there's a greater need for community leadership and um, community-based participatory approaches, which are a way to really intentionally partner with community at every step in the way in terms of not only identifying goals alongside community, but also um, working through the process of meeting those goals in partnership. And so this is really a next step for possibly vision as well as other eye care research or initiatives. And 
In wrapping up here, I also just wanted to make a couple of resources available for anyone who may be interested. Um, the first resource listed here is a social needs screening form, a version of what um, Hopkins Community Connection had used. And the second here is a resource for students um, or trainees who might be interested in building or supporting, um, joining com a community of student-led eye clinics um, like the Vision Program. And so thank you with that. I'd like to just thank you all so, so much for being here and listening and um, open it up to any questions. Thanks so much, Christina. That was, that was an awesome presentation and I'm sure we're gonna have a, a good discussion here in the Q and A. Uh, a couple of just quick messages. Uh, one, if you have questions for Christina about her presentation, please use the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to enter those questions. We did, uh, we did capture one uh, that someone put in the chat. So maybe I'll, th I'll throw that out to Christina and then we can, uh, uh, we can go from there. But the other thing I wanted to make you all aware is that um, the summit presentations are, they are being recorded. They'll be posted on the Prevent Blindness website after the session, the link is in the, in the chat uh, and recordings of the presentations will uh, be available within a week. So again, please share any questions for the presenter, uh, Christina, through the Q&A function. Uh, but what we heard from one person, Christina, how can ophthalmology education be increased in medical schools? So I think there are ways that would be tailored to the individual programs and more broad ways. Of course, it could be that medical schools require the um, clinical rotation through ophthalmology um, that only I think around 10% of um, medical schools now do. Um, so that's, that would be one kind of simple way to increase people's clinical exposure to ophthalmology. Um, yep. But I think just in increasing the number of lecture hours, um, the focus of ophthalmology in the um, preclinical med school curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that I'm not, I think would vary across medical schools, how exactly that's been cut down over sure. the past decades. But um, yeah, building, building both of those things up as well as, again, possibly through um, these kind of supplemental experiences, extracurricular experiences that people right. seem to be getting in ophthalmology, which is also really exciting that people can learn through these. No, that's, that's excellent. So what, what existing education about uh, social determinants of health do medical students typically uh, um, receive today? You know, as you were just talking about, we're, we're probably, we're lacking on this side of uh, ophthalmology rotation, maybe, but what is it that they do receive? So to my knowledge, a lot of um, professional organizations have kind of described the need for greater social determinants of health education, but I think it's in that earlier stage where I don't believe there's any real standardization across medical schools um, that they must include anything about um, social determinants of health. And when looking into it a bit, I was able to find only a couple, a couple reports from medical schools that have um, had kind of a social determinants of health learning activities yeah. that seem to be really successful and appreciated within those schools. But seem to be more of the exception than the norm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing uh, and and it's so important in the work you did and 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 why you're receiving the award today that a lot of times, you know, vision just gets taken for granted. And you know, I, I because I've been in the industry for a while, I always ask people, you know, when's the last time you had an eye exam? And amazing the number of times where people will say never or 20 years or something like that. It's just it's just so important, but can you can you speak more about how the vision program was created and and what resources that required to 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 do? Yeah, it it definitely um, was a great collaboration between a lot of people. Um, so it required a lot from um, both the medical student side, Dr. Johnson, but as well from Wilmer as an institution. Um, many, many faculty members um, were engaged in the creation of the program, as well as um, you have to think what happens right when you kind of go out into the community and identify disease, um, the follow-up plans in terms of getting people connected with um, Wilmer faculty who on their own volunteer schedule um, were able to screen um, individuals or to 
sorry, to follow up from the screened individuals and be able to diagnose and then figure out what clinical next steps would be needed, as well as in kind of particular situations where um, there was, if there were ever, um, and somebody who really needed a procedure urgently, for example, mm -hmm. what, would the, what would be done there? And so a lot of a lot of resources um, and funding did did go into the vision program as well as just um, faculty hours and volunteerism. Um, so really a big, a big collaborative effort. That's awesome. So I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you before, but there's a question coming in from Burkina Faso. I don't know if you've, uh, oh. so to tackle a lack of specialists, it says we are in training non-specialist health workers like nurses to screen eye disease, including it in inclusive education classrooms. Do you have any experience and experience on how that and how uh, were the outcomes? Uh, any experience, I guess, with that and, and how were the outcomes? In terms of training individuals, yeah, tra training non-specialist health workers like nurses and all to to participate in the screening program. That's how I that's how I read it. Well, I in a lot of ways consider medical students to be very non-specialist um, <laughs> individuals, and so I think I think so. I think especially when we're um, working with volunteers as as part of Vision, essentially what occurs is that. Um, we welcome volunteers for anybody from the first year of med school, so they could be day one um, up to their fourth year, and if they're taking any interim years or MD, PhDs, everybody mm -hmm. is welcome to volunteer um, from the clinical side of things. Like I mentioned, we do have undergraduate volunteers and postbacs who are doing the, who would be, um, who would have to just because of the way it, our like coverage works for the program, who have to be doing non-clinical things if they do mm -hmm. volunteer. Clinical side, we have a training kind of built up um, that we ask all volunteers to go through. And so um, it requires people um, to do some pre reading and then attend the session. And then we have med students mm -hmm. who um, teach how to work the different stations, and different stations kind of have different um, requirements as well and that some um, actually ask that are more involved for you to spend an afternoon with a faculty member and so um, I think that would be the closest thing to um, to non-specialist kind of the training that we work for it and if sure. if you're interested I'm sure um, like please please reach out and because I'm sure we'd be happy to share the materials that we've created for that um, over the years. No that's awesome. So, you know, I appreciate everyone who, who joined us and, uh, and, and gave the, brought the questions to, uh, to the forefront here. So I want to also especially thank Christina, one, for her work and for her great presentation and congratulate her again on, on winning the award.